here at uh, COP27 in Egypt. I'm here with Joel from the UK. Joel, can you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about you and uh, why you're here. Yeah, hi. So uh, I'm Joel from uh, Replanet, uh, and we're here uh, launching a new campaign at COP27 called Reboot Food. Now, Reboot Food is a radical plan to phase out animal agriculture and replace it with a much better alternative. And that one is precision fermentation. It's a way of producing animal proteins that are biologically identical to those that we get from uh, killing animals, but without the harm that that causes. And we're also calling for plant-based diets to go with it, and most importantly, rewilding. So planetary scale rewilding, we believe that we could free up more than three quarters of global agricultural land to give it back into nature. Wow, sounds amazing. Can you maybe in your own words explain why animal agriculture is so bad? Yeah, so animal agriculture is the single biggest cause of the sixth mass extinction of species. And to understand that, we have to really just think about the importance of land use. So today, 28% of the surface of the planet that's ice-free is animal agriculture. That's more than all of our forests combined. Now, if you're a natural wild species, you just need space. You need space for your wild ecosystem to exist, and it just simply can't also be there with farming at the same time. So the simple reason that it's so destructive is it just uses too much space, way, way too much space. Now, what comes with that is also a big, terrible thing called the carbon opportunity cost. And that is that we need to be rewilding that area to draw carbon down out of the air, particularly if we start overshooting our climate targets, which we almost certainly going to. Now, if we do do that, the potential is huge. One paper found that we could be looking at sequestering 68% of global carbon emissions in farmland rewilding, which is basically like we would solve the headache of most of the climate delegates here at COP27. But it's not just those opportunity costs, it's not just the land, there are direct emissions as well. And animal agriculture, depending on the metrics, emits somewhere between 16 and a half to even over a quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions. Now, even if you take that smallest number, that means that animal agriculture alone emits more greenhouse gases than our entire global transport system. All the cars, all the planes, all the ships. It's insane. It should be a main item on the agenda, but it's not. It's barely discussed here at all. Yeah. True. What, what's your take on COP27? Can you give any personal um, opinions on, for example, the menu that's being served here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, one of the things I've been struck by most is that at a climate change conference, there is meat on the menu. And not just like a little bit of meat, it's, it's mainly meat. So over at this restaurant over here, you can get yourself steak, you can get yourself beef and chicken and fish. And if you're lucky, there might be some vegetables. The first day I queued here for an hour to try and get plant-based food, and all they give me was rice. That was literally the only thing here. The paradigm is completely bonkers. And so what I'm left with feeling, essentially, is that this is a kind of, this is a human self-interest conference, essentially. We're here sorting out our own mess, a technical problem with too much gas in the atmosphere. But ultimately, in terms of like the philosophy of this place, it's still a philosophy of domination. We're still here dominating other species. We dominate them for our food. We dominate them for all other aspects of our society. And whilst the climate change question kind of opens up a, a little bit more of an ecological conscience, more of a sense that we're part of the bigger system, it's nowhere near close to that full realization that we need to move from human domination of an ecosystem to understanding that they're just one part of the web of life that we're fully interconnected to, that on a philosophical level we are absolutely one with, and that on a true survival level we're not going to survive without understanding that place within it. Yeah. I have this, this strong feeling that um, the way we treat animals is really very much interconnected to how we treat nature and ourselves as well. Um, so I also hear you're uh, with Animal Rebellion in uh, the UK. Um, can you tell us a little bit about their, their latest campaign and why are you doing the things that you do, like civil disobedience? Uh, yeah, so I'm also a spokesperson for Animal Rebellion, as you said, uh, in the UK. And the recent campaign that Animal Rebellion has been running, I've been a big part of, uh, is the Plant-Based Future campaign, which has been blockading dairy manufacturing plants and dairy distribution plants in the UK to try and disrupt the supply of dairy to UK households. Now, the reason that it's running that campaign and using civil disobedience, such as gluing ourselves to things, sitting down in the road, disabling lorries that are delivering milk, is that essentially civil disobedience is the most proven technique 
technique in, prov in protest history at achieving radical, rapid societal change. Not small, incremental changes in policy, the way that these kind of things work, but fundamental radical shifts in the way that we act. So civil disobedience in the past has seen the civil rights movement succeed in the United States of America. It's seen suffragettes succeed in the United Kingdom and other protests for women's rights. It's seen the Indian independence movement, the overthrow of Milosevic. It, it's seen transformations throughout society. And I think when it comes to animal agriculture and our domination of animals, it, it is a paradigm as big as that. It's a paradigm as significant as whether we're going to continue oppressing other sentient beings is just the same. So we have to use civil disobedience as part of that bigger mix. And so for me, I think really the two most profound things that we could do to liberate all the animals that we're killing, but here for COP to save the climate, is civil disobedience and those new technologies, precision fermentation. Those are the two things that have got the biggest potential. The rest of this, waste of time as far as I'm concerned, really. Awesome. Yeah, very interesting. I feel like here at, at COP especially, I feel a, a very strong disconnect from the people like you who are pushing for change and the people at the top who are making the decisions. How, how can we close the gap? How do we get the message out? Yes, yeah, so um, what I think needs to happen next year is there needs to be a load of disruption of COP, basically. So uh, if uh, anyone from Animal Rebellion or anyone thinking about civil disobedience is listening to this, I would say we need to be here in numbers, disrupting this process. It, it, basically, it can only carry on this way because it has permission to do so. It's too easy to go into this conference room and if someone says the word livestock, you say, oh, we don't talk about that here, sort of thing. And that's going to continue until someone forces the issue in some ways. The other way, I think, to get around it is essentially to bypass this whole process and go through the route of, say, precision fermentation, hopefully maybe cultivated meat, in which we essentially see countries that realise the potential in it, like right now is happening in Singapore, yeah. go, this is huge, they invest in it massively, it takes off, and then other countries that are here happily going, no, 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 livestock's not an issue, <laughs> go, oh, oh my god, these people are suddenly getting rid of livestock and making loads of money out of it, yeah. it's a great new business, and then they're going to play catch up, and I think right. that'll be the way that this starts to change. But, really any hope that the NGOs here are going to actually step up and get livestock reduction on the agenda. Forget about it. Like, yeah. literally forget about it. It's not going to happen. And I've had lots of conversations here. I've met, you know, some of the big places, WWF, the big NGOs. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And where do you see animal agriculture grow, uh, going? Like, we are at the, really at the a threshold. We're breaking so many planetary boundaries. Do you think there's a future for, for animal agriculture? Is it going to be even possible to farm animals profitably in the future? Well, one thing that might happen with precision fermentation or with cultivated meat is that it might send the livestock industry into its own sort of death spiral. Now, a good example of this is the fact that uh, a good proportion of animal products today goes on a business to business. Like it's sold to people who then put those products into processed foods. So let's take milk. 30% of milk gets turned into a powder, a protein white powder that gets sold to people to make cheeses and lasagnas and cakes and that kind of stuff. And then people eat it that way. Now, essentially, those people making the cakes and the lasagnas, all they want to buy is some white protein stuff. And if precision fermentation can give identical white protein stuff from milk, but without the cow, it knocks out 30% of the business model of milk awesome. without people changing their habits whatsoever. And if that happens, well, the business model is over. Interesting. And what time um, horizon are we looking at, in your opinion? Yeah, so it, it's quite difficult to, to call it exactly in terms of where the price point is going to come. The main thing with precision fermentation is that it needs to be cost competitive with and then lower than those animal products. And at the moment, casein and whey, the two proteins in milk, they're quite cheap at the moment. But some predictions, if you look at Reboot, uh, so Rethink X, um, they are actually projecting that we're looking at kind of like on the five year horizon from now, we could be reaching competitive price points for this. And once you reach that, then the spiral will happen very, very quickly. Cultivated meat, we're looking more at the kind of seven to ten year frame. Right. Awesome. Do you have any last remarks for animal and climate activists out there watching you? Yeah, I think I want to say that the, the main thing is, even though this is deeply depressing and this is essentially an animal domination conference more than anything else, uh, is that there are people like you that are here. So the plant-based pavilion, the plant-based treaty, people that are at here with a foot in the door for the first time, uh, it's tiny, but the fact that you're actually here 
like that is the beginning of something that can now spread. So I really hope, I mean, it's awful that there have to be more than more cops, but we have to hope next year it's going to just be expanding and expanding and expanding. So that is a really hopeful point. And so despite the darkness, I do have some hope for the future. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Cheers. Great interview.